My partner, G, and I affirm the resolution resolved. The United States federal government ought to pay reparations to African Americans. First definition, ought implies obligation, Silverstein 84. In assenting to an ought judgment directed at somebody else, the assenter's authority over the person to whom the ought judgment is directed approximates the absolute authority he has over himself. If P asserts to A ought to do X, then he will force or compel A to do X. The self-forcing condition seems to be necessary as well as sufficient for A's assenting to I ought to do X. And reparations are fines and or amends, Torpian 6. The term reparations was once used exclusively in connection with fines exactly among states. It has also come to refer to amends to non-state groups and individuals. Next, observations. Observation 1, ought does not mean should, therefore there is no burden on the act to prove solvency, only an obligation. And observation 2, the con must prove that either the reparations are unjustified or that reparations would not make amends. Contention 2 is it's all your fault. Slavery is the root cause of unequal education levels by race, unjust enrichment, and other injustices. The Journal of Blacks in Higher Education writes in 2000 that for 250 years, blacks in America were systematically denied education, fair income, accumulation of wealth or property. The idea of unjust enrichment of white family fortunes were generated through the sweat of unpaid slaves. And the United States federal government is directly to blame. Posner in 3. The government, the, our governments are blameworthy because they could have acted otherwise, and they owe a remedy to the descendants because they could have foreseen that the descendants would be injured by the harm to their original property owners. And ethical collectivism means that obligations are not rescindable in groups. The United States has to pay Posner and Free. The group can be blameworthy and responsible in the same sense as individuals, and their obligations are not reducible. At time one, Group P wrongfully injured Group Q. Therefore, at time two, Group P must pay reparations to Group Q, as long as each group can be said to persist from time one to time two. Mark the card two. And racism that is, uh, that. How it continues, for, uh, that continues inevitably leads to genocide and structural violence. Studer and Willis in eight. There must be a number of conditions in place to allow genocidal violence to continue. All cultures have categories to diminish between us and them, between the members of our group and others. Classification and civilization are widespread human practices that are part of our national identity and cultural self-awareness. When joined by dehumanization, these qualities move a society. Dehumanization relegates the classified group to a category of subhumanity, making it easier to overcome an aversion to kill it. Contention three is the ends justify the means. Reparations are key to repair an unjust system. Rascal in four. Financial reparations change uh, financial reparations change the unjust system that continues to marginalize the descendants of those who were first wrong. Financial reparations provided today would not only help descendants living today, but those in the future as well. And reparations have the potential to disrupt structures. Yamamoto 98. Reparations claims and the right discourse they engender in attempts to harness the power of the state can be appreciated as intensely powerful political acts that challenge re uh, racial assumptions underlying past and present social arrangements. They bear potential for uh, contributing to institutional restructuring. And according to Ron Haskins, uh, although the achievement... Uh, okay, oh, and... Uh, and this has two implications. First, according to Ron Haskins of the Brookings Institute, although the achievement gap narrowly was narrowed so much in the 1970s and 80s, they have since proved several interests into closing further. Uh, which means that educate, like the educational un uh, inequalities happen for two reasons. First, is that racial housing policies by the United States cost segregation. According to Richard Rothstein of the Economic Policy Institute, uh, it has become conventional for policymakers to assert that the residential isolation of low-income black children is now de facto the accident of economic circumstance, demographic trends, personal preference, and private discrimination. But the historical record demonstrates that residential segregation is jure, resulting from racially motivated and explicit public policy with ethics injury to the present. And unequal funding between richer and poorer areas, according to Emma Brown of the Washington Post, state and local governments are together spending less per people in the poorest school districts than they are in the most affluent school districts. And first, this caused this, uh, in, uh, and first, uh, reparation solved because it caused increased access to pre-kindergarten, according to a study conducted by the White House. Early childhood education increases cognitive and achievement scores by 0.35 standard deviations on average, or nearly half the black-white difference in the kindergarten achievement gap. Mark that part of the gap. And teaching style reformation according to the Herald of uh, Hunter Collar. In order to, to close the achievement gap between races and math and reading, one possible way for schools to do this is to encourage the teachers to engage in practices that disproportionately benefit their minority students. Uh, that's all. Contention 1. The federal government directly threatens African Americans. 
Of the many ways in which the federal government has harmed African Americans, here are three. First, Jim Crow laws. Institutions like poll taxes and literacy tests were intended to prevent blacks from engaging in society after the Civil War. Houser writes, the poll tax is an effective disenfranchising device precisely because the upper class white Democrats who framed it designed it not to be paid by those who did not, they did not want to vote. Literacy tests provided a similar barrier. According to James Parse of the Times Picayune, tests were created specifically to disenfranchise black voters. For this reason, only 3% of voting age blacks in the South were registered to vote in 1940, according to the Constitutional Rights Foundation. They further that such restrictions prevented African Americans from holding elected office, influencing public policy, and making use of local institutions like law enforcement, courts, and public schools. Second, civil forfeiture. Cornell University's Legal Information Institute denotes civil forfeiture as a legal proceeding against property rather than people that was alleged to be involved in a crime. According to the ACLU, civil forfeiture laws are disproportionately enforced against African Americans who were never convicted of a crime. The government, in fact, incentivizes such abuse. Sarah Selman writes in the New Yorker, in 1984, Congress established a special fund that turned over proceeds from forfeitures to the law enforcement agencies responsible for them. The Department of Justice has a quota for $6 billion annually in seized assets. Government-sponsored stealing from minorities already more likely to live in poverty is a bad way to initiate trust between law enforcement and communities. Third, drug offenses. Austin Timings of the Harvard Political Review explains that blacks serve as much time for a drug, drug offense, 58.7 months, as whites do for a violent offense, which is 61.7 months. He explains the first mandatory minimum sentencing laws were established in the 100 to 1 sentencing ratio of crackers to powder cocaine. The discrimination comes in the demographics. Crack cocaine is used more frequently in low-income minority neighborhoods, while powder cocaine is a high choice for white lawyers. Attention to Reparations assign financial value to the sovereign. Harper's Magazine estimated that it will require $97 trillion to pay for the hours of uncompensated work done during the slavery era, which would require extracting, on average, about $300,000 from every American of non-slave descent. Making amends is therefore impossible. Either pro advocates paying less than the value of completed work or paying an impossible figure. Even if $97 trillion were reasonable, Perkins writes, the troublesome aspects for reparations lie in physical pain, mutilation, or death, psychological suffering, and the like. These cannot be genuinely repaired with money or any object or action. Thus, we negate. Uh, all right, why does cost imply that it must be able to? So, recognize that for the government to actually fulfill this obligation, they have to be able to actually have the capability of fulfilling it. Okay, so can I not be morally obligated to do something even like if I cannot? So do we it? tell you that you can't be morally obligated to do so because you simply cannot fulfill it. So therefore, you're always acting immorally in your world because you can't fulfill something. So therefore, you can't have a moral obligation if you can't fulfill the action. Okay, but if I always have like, okay, so there's literally on the ground. Like, like I have morally can't operate that way. What? Morality can't operate that way where you always are acting immorally just because you cannot do something. That's like an insane moral system. Wait. No, no, I'm not. I'm not talking about that. Like, I'm just, I'm just, like, I'm just asking. Like, if there's litter on the ground, am I morally obligated to pick it up? Like, me? Because you can't pick up the litter. Like, you okay. have to pass But does that obligation like not exist? Like, uh, in, in like infinite, right? Like, am I not? Yeah, obligated no, that doesn't like, exist. Like, that is bounded okay. by your capacity to fulfill that obligation. Yeah, absolutely. So, given the fact that we talk about civil forfeiture, given the fact that Black Americans are going to be fined no matter if we give them reparations or not, isn't the impact that reparations could potentially have going to be diminished by the fact that the government and then seize the money they just give it back to their parents. Okay, first of all, your evidence doesn't give like a way that the money would be seized back. No, we absolutely and second, do. Like, 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 okay, like even in the fun. past, like there's no example of like having not just like not about African American, but like when we've given reparations, like this does not happen to like African okay. Americans, not gonna happen to So the reason we don't target Japanese Americans is because we view them as model minorities and also they have relative income inequality relative to white individuals. So given we target disproportionately minority neighborhoods who execute civil forfeiture, it's very realistic that this is something that's going to be executed against African Americans. But then let's also move to the fact that you're giving us, like basically you tell us that this is all terrible and then you give us a variety of mechanisms we can actually solve for this. But how, given the fact that we haven't seen like any sort of decrease in terms of achievement within education, how are you going to meaningfully change that just by throwing more money at the problem? Look, it's not just throwing more money at the problem, rather what it is like restructuring the way education works. Like if starting with like Head Start would be like probably implemented in a world where uh, reparations were given right. Head Start right and restructures the way education works from the beginning, from things like preschool and kindergarten. Uh, uh how does 
reparations assigned value. So if we're putting a, like obviously the assigned value, that's the purpose of reparations. We assign a monetary value wait, to wait, suffering wait, accrued by wait, Okay, so our definition of reparations was not like solely monetary. Yet, like I still want to understand like how it assigns a value. So like actually, for instance, like if I was to get paid for my quote unquote like suffering, let's say here at Snippy, is that like less <laughs> assigning a value? Yeah, that is assigning a value. That is less assigning a value, value. value. Not a value to, okay. So, so value is my labor, cool. So that's different than suffering. Yeah, that so, is entirely different than suffering. But No, but like recognize that the fact that when you put a value judgment on what a suffering is, we say that there's a limit to the amount of suffering someone has, like there is a monetary value that can repair that suffering. So that's the level of assigning value. Thanks. All right. Uh. I'm going to in my first constructive speech, then I'm going to go down and I'm going to point out all the reasons why the concept is wrong in this case. All right. Quality of life according to Van Bilgen of Ohio State University. The well-educated have lower levels of emotional distress, including depression, anxiety, and anger, and physical distress, including aches and pains and delays. Education reduces distress largely by way of paid work, non-alienated alienated work, and economic resources. All right, now on to rebuttal. The first thing I want to point out is our observations for that Zoe comes up here and says, look, Odd needs a moral responsibility insofar as the agent can repair the applicants. You're going to prefer our definition because Silverstein literally says in his definition of odd that even if you don't want to do it, even if you can't can't do it, you literally should. The example that Tasia gives you of person X not wanting to do something is the exact reason why we ought to do it. Because we should force our thing, ourselves to at least try to engage in things that we may not know if we can do, but should at least try to do, because that's where the obligation actually lies. Contention one is that the promise demonstrates that the U.S. can and should make a mess wrong church or whatever. All right, first contention, the federal government harms African Americans. You're going to take the entire first contention and turn it, because that falls on our side of the table. Right? When Tate and I are talking about the fact that the U.S. federal government has armed African Americans, that's more of the reason why it should at least try to make amends for it, right? All the more justification for moral obligation to be held. Secondly, another reason, if you actually buy the Ned burden, then the USFG does nothing. If they're not doing nothing, and we tell you the status quo is the U.S. federal government is actively harming African Americans, doing nothing means they remain complicit in harming African, African Americans. At least trying to make reparations is always going to be preferable because if you don't make aberrations, you, uh, reparations, excuse me, you only condone the status quo. We tell you that the status quo leads to like lower quality of lives for African Americans, in, in, with ex enormous educational and achievement gaps for African Americans, more likely to die at the hands of a police officer, etc., etc. Like all these anecdotes, all these examples that we know to be true. That's the reason, right? She goes and talks about silver, for silver forfeiture, disproportionately disenfranchising African Americans, black suburban more crime, housing, etc., etc. All of um, all relevant irrelevant, right? Then she gets to the point where even though you can't provide African Americans reparations, right, there's no way we can actually give African Americans reparations because there's no way that we can pay back for this. We have a few responses for this. The first one is that even giving reparations or the act of reparations, even if they want to say it won't actually work, refer to the Yamamoto part, right? Yamamoto talks about the fact that giving reparations gives rise to social, political, and narrative discourse about what exactly racism means. It's how we actually interact with racism, the systemicity of racism, and how we end up confronting it. Like confronting what we have done to people, and then what we actively and the federal government has done to African Americans, all in an attempt to repair them, right? She says there is no way to make up for hundreds of years of slavery, of wrongdoing, no way to decentralize the number into something that is either paid off or paid to, right? The second response is going to be the one that I already gave you before. If you are actively not trying to make amends, you are complicit in the situation at hand. The USFG prove it. They never tell you that the USFG isn't the one responsible for the harms. In fact, they're, like their first contention in their whole entire case tells you the USFG is responsible for the harms. Therefore, if they don't have any way to tell you, then you shouldn't at least try to do it because they haven't given you a different definition to refer, to refer over off. You must admit that the USFG should at least try to make reparations so they don't end up buying into the status quo. Right? Over that, let's just go through contention one, like we take it down. Basically what they have to do is give you a reason to refer their definition. At the point where our odd encompasses that you should at least try to, something, uh, try to do something you don't know what to do, they need to give you a reason why that doesn't stand. As of yet, that's all. Go down. Now, Gia's biggest mistake in the rebuttal speech was falling into the trap we provided that the United States federal government is at fault for absolutely all of this. She tries to turn our first contention, and that's where she falls into the trap. But before I explain that, we're going to go on to definitions and framework. First, their definition of ought from, I believe it was Silverstein, says, quote, in assenting to an ought judgment directed towards someone else, the assenter's authority over the person to whom the ought judgment is directed approximates the absolute authority he has over himself. Absolute authority means a person has to have the action available to them to take. 
And if you don't have that, look back to their first observation when they explain that they don't need to provide any solvency, just the obligation. If you don't have the authority to explain yourself and to take an action, you don't have the obligation coming back to you. I don't have an obligation to solve world hunger because it's impossible for me to do anything about it for each individual suffering from it. Next. Go on to their definition of reparations. Prefer ours first because any time the United States federal government takes an action, it goes through legislative or judicial process, meaning that any possible way in which the government could act goes through the legal system. Because Black's Law is the definitive legal dictionary, prefer that definition. Next, let's go to their observations. We agree to the first one. For the second one, we agree to the no amends part. But they still have to prove that reparations would do something different or that it's possible for the United States government to engage in. Let's go on to the contention level. First, we'll, we'll look to back to the definition of ought. Hoffman writes, ethical arguments about political issues must, of course, take into account the realities of the political context and the rules of the game, or the domestic or international political milieu. Since ought implies can, a deontological ethic in which the definition of what is right is not derived from a calculation of what is possible, condemns itself to irrelevance if its commands cannot be carried out in the world as it is. Next, let's go to Thompson. He writes, because many different officials contribute in many ways to decisions and policies of government, it is difficult even in principle to identify who is morally responsible for political outcomes. This is what we call the problem of many hands. Criteria for personal responsibility are adopted to a common wide range of moral theories that hold us responsible for outcomes insofar as we cause them and do not act in ignorance or compulsion. On these criteria, we can say that one official is more or less responsible than another official. You can't lump some of the United States United States federal government into one group and just say this action or this whatever is responsible for the entirety as a whole. The reason for this is that one, the US federal government is a failed state and is not able to act uh, in any moral obligation. There's a reason for this. First, the US as it is only concerns itself with power in terms of race relations. Ta-Nehisi Coates details in his 2015 book Between the World and Me, the nature of violence against African Americans is a systematic attempt to destroy black bodies. Second, U.S. unable to alter its course. Miller writes, security from violence is an important state obligation and rates of lethal violence in the U.S. are exceptionally high relative to other democracies. It is important to understand the exceptional status of the U.S. by ex exploring the fragmented, racialized, and legalistic institutions. Still the Miller card, y'all. I argue that both violence and punishment in the U.S. can be seen as limited forms of state failure with respect to African Americans. According to the State Department, state failure includes four dimensions. Corruption, collapsed economic systems, political exclusion, and exploitation of public resources. The black community has been uniquely affected by each since the transatlantic slave trade's inception. One, Bernie Reed of the Urban Child Research Center vouches for the collapsed economic systems dimension in black households, noting that the unemployment rate has doubled with increases in poverty rates during the same period. Two, National Center for Education Statistics finds black children are three times as likely to live in poverty. Three, corruption. Extend the, the Stillman part of law enforcement involving civil forfeiture. Four, political exclusion. Extend the Kauser card, which explains to you that this is systemic. Five, according to Black Lives Matter, a black person is murdered every 28 hours by a taxpayer-funded police officer. Exploitation of public resources, they can't solve it all. Okay, so first let's talk about this authority over self-thing. Why exactly does that definition exclude crime? It doesn't necessarily exclude trying, but okay. it does exclude possibility if you don't have the capability, okay. which is where our, our failed state argument comes into play. But to be clear, under your definition, trying to do something is something perfectly acceptable. Trying to do something. Okay, cool. Yes. I do. Um, is it possible for the United States to fully make amends? Uh, we think that even if it's not possible to fully make amends, even trying to make amends is going to have a severe life consequence. So does that mean the perpetual cycle of needing to continue paying reparations if still try and it fails and you try again and it fails. Look, we're not saying that we're going to solve everything and make the world a perfect place, right? We think the USFG, the US federal government, has an obligation to at least attempt to make reparations, to at least attempt to make up for what was done. Like, your, like what you advocate for is quite literally the US federal government complicit in the harms occurring against African Americans and not doing anything about it. Oh no, we agree that the United States federal government has continued to perpetuate the harms. We would just dispute that even though the federal government is complicit, they don't have the available political means in order to take action. Okay, sir. Let's talk about individual... Um, actually, I have a question for you. I haven't gotten to ask one of those yet. Um, I'm, I'm looking at the second contention that you say the ends justify the means. Sure. Can we apply this liberally to any policy-based institution? Uh, no. Why not? 
because uh, it's irrelevant. Okay. Watch the book. It's a, right, okay, so, all right, so talking about uh, ends versus no, actually, let's talk about individual responsibility. So you're like, you can't you lump the U.S. into one group, right? Can you explain why? Yes, because public administrators are divided into many different types of people. There's the Department of Transportation, okay. Department of Homeland Security. Sure. It's impossible to place fault for immoral policy decisions on any one person. And at the moment you try to do that, you make a good moral person culpable and a bad immoral person justice. Okay, so I'm wondering, do you have any response to our cause of harm? It talks about group identity. And if you belong to a group that actually harms another person, you are culpable because you belong to that group. I would say that's the most absurd thing I've ever heard. Because if you belong to a group that is harming somebody else and you actively aren't taking part in that, I'm not going to follow the Department of Transportation for the invasion of Iraq. That's ridiculous. Right. Do you have another question? Uh, yes, I do. Looking into your response to our first contention, you're saying that we should turn it all onto your side of the flow simply because the U.S. federal government is helpful. Uh, right, so you list all of these harms. All of these harms are traced back to the U.S. federal government being complicit in policies that are like this, not trying to actively help African Americans, not doing anything specifically for African Americans. Okay, well, what is an amend? What does that word imply? Perfect, I'm glad you brought that up. So an amend is when you try to make something better. Try to make something better. So yeah. you don't think that, a, that an amend leads to some kind of cause and effect relationship in which you wrong and then you make it right? Oh, that's exactly what I mean, right? You and amend, then you, make you it try right. to make it better. Our definition from Silverstone is odd implies obligation, specifically like you were like the line that Chris is actually good for us because authority over the self means that you are forcing yourself to do something, even if you physically and can't do it. The fact that you are forcing yourself means that you are trying to do something that makes it better, right? And you always have this moral obligation. For instance, if there is a baby falling out of a window and I cannot physically try to get there in time to catch it, I still try, right? I am morally obligated to try to catch that baby from that window, even if I can't. Maybe the fact that I try makes the status quo a little bit better. Uh, second is uh, our definition of reparations are pretty much the same as your definition of reparations. Uh, like our definition also says it was once exclusively uh, in connection with fines. Now with other things as well. There's no offense on the other parts as well, which is why we can still access that. Uh, also, go to the observations. Like uh, they agree with the observations. Uh, extend our first contention. Uh, the reason that they like fall for our first contention is very specific. Like the United States is directly the blame. Positive, or the positive evidence talks about uh, when we talk ethical collectivism, which means that everybody is responsible because uh, when, like if there is a group that exists from back then that was at fault, and a group that exists from now that is uh, impacted, then like the group that was well, at fault has to be paid. And they also concede the Yamamoto evidence, which is a pretty damning piece of evidence in the entire debate, uh, specifically because he talks about like when you give people reparations, you empower those people, not like by giving them money you uh, you introduce uh, the power of politics, right? Because like everybody can now access politics, everybody can now uh, like, congregate, and they help each other struggle. And our, la our last uh, contention was that education drastically helps, uh, like education drastically helps uh, African Americans because it increases the, like, the ability for them to get jobs and for them to be like less distressed and stuff like that, which means they can get, has the potential to solve racism. Their only argument was like it's a trap, but it's not actually a trap, right? Because we can, if they, we can impact them by saying like uh, by trying, we can actually make it better. Which means that the Yamamoto evidence specifically like turns their first contention and their second contention with just a bunch of reasons, uh, which is like the United States physically cannot. But I've already answered that in our framework. All we have to prove is the United States has an obligation to try. Like if it can try, then it has an obligation to try. We will not probably pay like all trillions of dollars, but the fact that we try is good enough, and the Yamamoto evidence still allows us to access all the impacts. Then they don't answer the fact that the U.S. federal government is a failed state and therefore cannot have a moral obligation because of state failure. Insofar as Tasia doesn't respond to any of these criteria for what constitutes a failed state, they can't win today's debate. But let's just do a summary anyway. First, make it clear that we're actually winning the morality debate. We've made two pieces of evidence. First, the Hoffman evidence, and second, the Thompson evidence. The Thompson evidence tells you that you cannot identify who is actually responsible or morally culpable for decisions because of the fact that there are such a wide variety of individuals who comprise the U.S. federal government. Recognize that a variety of individuals oppose the enslavement of African Americans, yet we still not hold them responsible because of the fact that political proceedings overruled them. But recognize that the first, then now I'm going to go into state failure. So there are four aspects of state failure that we tell you. First, corruption. Second, collapse economics. Third, political exclusion. And fourth, exploitation of public resources. Recognize that insofar as Gia concedes this first contention, she concedes that the U.S. federal government is a failed state given they use their ability to have any sort of force or monopoly of force in order to do all of these things, particularly at the political exclusion of African Americans, which we tell you the Jim Crow laws, but 
Yamamoto evidence in their link, given they concede the Yamamoto evidence, they're losing today's ground. Yamamoto actually talks about critical legal theory in another, another article that he's written. And he says that reparations laws are hegemonic devices employed by those in power to induce consent to existing social and economic relationships and reflect no more than illusions of social progress. Reparations, in fact, are just used to make it the African Americans complicit in the systems that oppress them and make it so that they aren't able to actually question the very foundational structures. But also recognize that they don't necessarily argue that they answer our second dimension, which tells you that you can't assign a value to suffering. All they say is, well, the ends justify the means. But then when they're asked in Crossfire whether or not the ends actually justify the means in every instance, they say, no, 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 that's insane. That's not applicable to every circumstance. For them to have a coherent moral philosophy, they have to say that this is applicable in every circumstance. Well, they can't do that. They lose today's reason. These reasons, perhaps, are the proposed. Uh, okay, so first of all, okay, so when you're talking about the Yamamoto part, right, like the reason he writes another response to the card is because he writes, even though they are hegemonic like issues of power that are used to employ this, they can be and do have the potential to make that. That's the entire point, right? He, right, he writes another part because it's critical of his own critical. Part. Yes, but they also have the power to make things worse. And when he writes in the next part that black bodies can be complicit in the structures that oppress them, he's saying that the discourse can also fail, which means you're losing access to at least a little bit of that part and still have yet to respond to the state failure that would almost make it inevitable that they would be in continuous systems. Right, okay, so sure. He can make it, they, a state can make things better, a state can make things worse. Your advocacy is that the state shouldn't even try. No, my them. advocacy is that a failed state shouldn't even try because they're going to do worse whether they try or they don't. <laughs> Wait, what, what impact is it like on the offense who gets worse from reparations? Well, my partner gave you one. Oh, civil forfeiture, yeah. So basically, like, what I was trying to explain in the first crossfire was that when you have civil forfeiture, it means that even if the U.S. federal government does give money to African Americans, they're going to avoid legal systems in order to regain that money that they just offered them, which then feeds into all the hegemonic illusions of solvency that we talk about beyond the United States. see that in piece of evidence, like, where it particularly makes the claim that the United States will always do this in every So we're not even saying that we'll always do this in every oh, instance. But this, yeah, the pivot already does this in the status quo. It's insane to assume that the United States federal government will completely change their past actions in order to equalize African Americans. So, like, actors can never change? Teacher, like, the, log the, the logical like, warrant here, here. Playing, uh, like, the logical warrant change. all throughout our first convention is that first you have Jim Crow laws. You know, that's the slavery, then Jim Crow laws. And then after that, you have civil forfeiture, and then you have poll taxes and literacy tests. This is a common narrative throughout all of American history. And if you're telling me that the state failure against particularly African Americans is going to change, I think that's optimistic. Like, recognize how much police brutality we've seen recently. The fact that you're saying, like, can actors never change? Well, the United States federal government hasn't changed. It just has shifted the way they present oppression into different forms over the time. Okay. All right. So, okay. So let's talk about the silver side evidence. You're like, yeah, it's important that you try to rescue this baby that's falling out a window. And if you try, it makes it better. But the baby's still dead. So how does that actually change the status quo of <laughs> Okay, first of all, you're saying the baby would only be dead if you didn't even try to save it. It might still be dead if you tried to save it and couldn't save it. So it's a dead baby falling out the window? Right? 
Finally, change your spawns and grant cross. Tasha tells you that states can change, even failed states. What they advocate is that even failed states should not try to do anything, should not try to become better states, because they're a failed state. How could they possibly do anything good? We always say you should try Yamamoto support them, right? Thirdly, their evidence doesn't even say that every single type of reparation will be harmed, right? Or like, even the outside. Fourth, they say you're not obligated to do something that you don't have the ability to do, right? So, okay, sure. How do you figure out if you have the ability to do something? If there's a huge rock standing in front of me, and it's like suffocating somebody, I don't just assume I can't move that rock, I'm not even going to try. You must at least try to move the rock to see if you can do it. If you can't move the rock, then you don't have a moral obligation. If you can, you must. Even if failed states are failed states, they should at least try to make reparations, then at least sh they should at least try to save African Americans and make some sort of amends for the rock, right? Fifthly, even if you don't believe any of that else, the attempt itself works. They never respond to the Yamamoto part. Yamamoto says that even if reparations are only attempted, they don't even succeed, but they are at least talked about. The possibility of them being achieved, the possibility of them actually talking about it, makes move for more people, gives rise to the reparations, and does that. I didn't hear you, right? Then they say reparations are going to assign a value. They are actually the only team in this case that assigns a value of human life when they get the number in yours. We never advocate for that. Vote out. That baby example got a little muddled, so let's use one that came up earlier in the round. If I see a litter on the ground, I most certainly have an obligation to pick it up. But I don't if I'm a paraplegic. And the point is that if the government is failing as a state against African Americans, we have the opportunity to at least try, insofar as trying would do absolutely anything about it. Which brings us to two voter issues. First, the obligation of should. GIA gives you a definition of reparations and tries to attack ours from Black's Law. We say that any time the government goes through a political process and takes an action, it's legislative or judicial. And insofar as law is the only way you can act, please prefer our legal definition. Then when we go on to should, they still don't respond to what we give them from Hoffman, and so extend that throughout the round. Second, let's go to state failure. Dropped throughout this round where the four part process was the four part process in which state failure comes about from the State Department. Corruption, collapsed economic system, political exclusion, and exploitation of public resources. AF says nothing about this until final focus. Do not let them get away with that and vote for them on it. Additionally, don't vote for them because trying feels good. Tonic E.C. Coates goes dropped throughout the round, and he says that racial violence cannot be divorced from notions of power. Notions of power are the exact reason why we're in the debacle between whites and blacks in the first place. Also, look to the Miller evidence, which goes on the same train with power. If they say nothing about that throughout the round, they can't possibly hope to win it. Going to their response on Yamamoto, Gita claims that we dropped that throughout the round. Actually, that's not true. In Grand Crossfire and in my partner's summary, she explains that Yamamoto has written a different article that says all of this is an illusion of social progress and reparations would entrap black bodies in the very system they want to stop being oppressed by. If you believe this and you believe they didn't respond to it, you have no other vote than negative.